Taking a nap. <laughs> Good morning and uh, welcome to the St. Mary's County Government Length of Service Awards Program, otherwise known as LOSAP, this uh, day, August 26, here in the County Government Building in Leonardtown, Maryland. We'll start off with a roll call seated all the way to my left. Jody Kwasney. Uh, Mike Hewitt, County Commissioner. Catherine Pratson, um, uh, Director of Human Resources. And Can on Zoom to today, CFO, we have... Trustee member. Sorry, I spoke over you, Jeanette. That's okay. Thank you. I'm here. Great, great. And the first thing we'll do is I will look for the approval of today's agenda. So moved. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next is the approval of the June 17th meeting minutes. I move to approve the minutes from the um, April 29th, 2022 meeting. April 29th, I apologize. I have June 17th on my. Yeah, is that? Um, June 17th. Oh, okay. So uh, potentially I move to approve the amended minutes from the June 17th, 2022 meeting. I'm looking at the minutes and they're dated April 29th. Let me pull them up. Second. Okay, I have a first, hold on one second, I'm just trying to view the minutes. I think the minutes were amended for the April 29th. Oh, is that what it was? It, it says to approve the minutes as amended. Yeah, but the title of the document, Length of Service Award Program, Friday, April 29th, 2022. Right. But then it says generated on Friday, June 17th, so I'm trying to figure out which day it is. Right. Well, let's just say we'll be okay. Okay. Well, I have a first and a second to approve the uh, minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up is a presentation from Mr. Wing regarding the second quarter investment performance report. All right, great. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all again here this morning. So we have the Q2 performance report that will start out and then we'll round out today's discussion as it relates to uh, our agenda with some recommendations in light of the um, first installment of the fiscal year contribution being transferred into principal. But if you wanna hop behind exhibit two, so grab exhibit two, flip that over. We'll start where we always do with the market environment, an overview of the economic and capital markets environment to provide context for how and why the trust performed the way it did. Uh, now, obviously, taking a step back before we dive in, the market environment has been very different in Q3 so far than what we saw in Q2. So as we work through some of the economic and market commentary, I'll weave in some other additional commentary as it relates to more recent data, more recent performance that we've been seeing in the current quarter. Uh, but with that said, we'll start on page 10 here with the U.S. economy, as we always do. And you can note in that top left bullet there, the economy did enter a quote-unquote technical recession in Q2 with real GDP or economic growth contracting for the second consecutive Executive quarter. You can see in that top bullet point in the end of the first sentence, the contraction was reported at down 0.9%. And there was a revision that came out yesterday morning, which slowed us, showed a uh, slight improvement 
but was still down 0.6%. So again, it's an open question about you know whether or not this will be officially designated a recession. Eventually, there's some debate in the media about that right now, but certainly the economy has slowed uh, any way you measure the numbers. And in Q2 specifically, again, in that first bullet point, uh, similar to the first quarter, there was a slowdown in private inventory and investment that was a big detractor from that headline number. But we also did see sort of the first signs of the Federal Reserve tightening policy and the impact that that would have on the economy. You can see at the end of that first bullet point, residential investment actually contracted by 14%, we believe largely due to rising mortgage rates. So when the Fed changes policy, it typically impacts the economy with a lag, but that interest rate channel where they're raising rates flows through to the mortgage market rather quickly. So we saw that impact in Q2. Uh, more recently, we've seen, um, you know, Home builder confidence decline a little bit, new home sales, existing home sales dip, and a slowdown in home price appreciation as well. So it certainly seems that Fed policy is, again, starting to filter through the economy, uh, first and foremost through the housing market. Now, with all that said, you know, there is a bright spot for the economy. We talk about it in the second bullet point there on page 10, namely the labor market. Uh, during the second quarter, there was an average of 375,000 job gains reported. We saw another pretty strong report in July that was reported in early August, north of 520,000 jobs. Uh, we'll get that next report uh, a week from today in September for August. But I always like to point out, even though this has been a relatively bright spot, all things considered, that it's a lagging indicator, right? It takes a long time for a company to uh, define the scope of a position, right? Post the position, collect resumes, do interviews, extend offers, and bring somebody on board. So in other words, these strong numbers that we're seeing from the labor market, sort of those decisions were already put in motion four or five, six months ago. And when you look at timelier indicators from the labor market, we talk a little bit about it in the third bullet point. Uh, every Thursday, the weekly jobless claims report comes out, and even though those numbers are at pretty low levels historically, they've moved up. So initial jobless claims are around 245,000. As of yesterday, the trough level was below 200, so they've gone up about 20% or so. And then continuing claims as well, so people that aren't filing for the first time but are filing again and again, that's also crept upward. So that's you know sort of a timelier measure of the labor market. So it'll be interesting to see how that filters <clears throat> through these monthly job reports, which again are somewhat of a lagging economic indicator as we close through the rest of this year. Hold that point. Whatever, yes. <clears throat> something I read that I thought was kind of interesting was that this high job, you know, number of jobs is people going back to get a second job because inflation's so high. Mm -hmm. You know, they, their cost of living is is getting so high that they've, they're taking on a second job now to uh, offset the cost of inflation. That's a, that's exactly right. Uh, as far as the breakdown of the most recent report that we saw in July, that was again sort of a blockbuster, if you will, north of 520. Thousand. I don't know the specific numbers, but I think it was at least a third to maybe half of that was part-time right. employment, which, you know, many of which to Commissioner Hewitt's point are people taking on additional uh, or multiple jobs to help with the increase in the cost of living. So I think you're spot on there, Commissioner. As it relates to page 11, really focusing on a couple of key themes from an economic perspective, but then also from a market perspective, namely inflation and the Federal Reserve. Inflation, as we note in the first bullet point, through June increased at multi-decade highs, a little bit north of 9%. Uh, we did comment there that that may mark the peak of inflation, meaning that the level will likely remain high, but the rate of change will likely slow. So we saw some evidence of that with the July report where inflation came out at eight and a half, so still very, very high compared to what we're used to over the past 10, 20 some odd years, but a slowdown from that 9.1%. So the key question moving forward here is, how quickly is that number gonna come down? And in turn, how does that impact what the Fed is going to do? Because as of through June, the Fed has raised rates, short-term rates by about uh, one and a half percentage points. They raised by another three quarters of a percentage points in July. They meet again in September. We're looking at 
a half or maybe another three quarters, and then they meet two additional times before the end of this year. So all told in 2022, we could be looking at short-term rates increasing anywhere between three and a quarter or maybe even 4%. And that dynamic is really, we believe, what caused the equity market weakness in Q2, namely that, as I mentioned, the economy is clearly slowed. The Fed is tightening policy or pumping on the brakes even further, and investors became concerned that that would exacerbate the economic weakness and then in turn perhaps impact corporate fundamentals, corporate earnings in a negative way. So equity markets, as we'll see here in just a minute, uh, really took it on the chin in Q2. Now, interestingly, if you look at the bottom right chart on page 11, and this speaks to more about what we believe is happening in Q3, what that chart is showing is just short-term rates that the Fed controls where the darker line is the historical level. But then when you look all the way to the right, you'll see a green line and then a lighter blue line. So that green line is what the market expects the path of short-term interest rates to be, where the blue line is what the Fed has signaled that they're likely going to do. So you can see they're pretty much in lock lockstep through the end of this year, but then there's a gap opening up where that green line actually comes down. So what that signifies is that the market actually expects the Fed to cut rates or reverse course in the back half of next year, maybe one or two times, because again, they're popping on the brakes so hard, then that may lead to further economic weakness. Hold, hold, that, hold that thought yes. for a second. So I get this thing, it's all about this idea that inflation is somewhat transitory, and that, you know, that was a belief that we had, or that was had six months ago, or whenever it started, you know, going, going really wild. So now we've increased the, the national debt by 300 trillion, I mean not 300 trillion, 300 billion. Mm -hmm. When you're out there at 26 trillion, what's 300 billion? I mean, it all kind of gets lost in the, but here's my point. Mm -hmm. What you've done, what, what we've done now is we've freed up say $300 a month in someone who was paying a student loan debt. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay that now. Now, of course, uh, I'm a little fuzzy on my, my thought processes, but it would seem like that money now is available to be put into the economy, which let's say is a good thing. <clears throat> but when we already get supply chain issues, mm -hmm. we all already have inflationary pressures, and maybe gasoline comes down, maybe commodities come down. What kind of pressure does that kind of income into the economy due to inflation. And my point is, I think it increases the, the it. All else equal, it's sort of in a vacuum, you'd be spot on there because, you know, debt itself is inherently deflationary, right? Because the interest payments used to repay back the debt is essentially an unproductive use of money, right? So now that that debt appears likely to be forgiven, it sounds like there's some legality questions around it, but let's assume it does go through. Then to your point, not only does $300 billion debt be forgiven, which adds to the national debt, but then say $300 billion would be back in consumer pockets, which then they could go and spend into the economy. So in a vacuum, on the marginal impact of that would be to keep inflation higher than it otherwise would have been. Now, $300 billion in a 17, 18 trillion dollar economy isn't a drop in the bucket, but at the same time, again, it should in turn maybe increase inflation a little bit higher than it otherwise would have been absent. Well, I guess it goes to my point of I'm not sure it's going to drop off. I'm not sure it's going to start tailing down. Well, I think you have to think about, you know, <clears throat> as far as the rate of change, just by definition, some of the months that we've seen pretty high inflation, notably in the back half of last year, are going to sort of roll off the calculation moving Oh, I forward. get you. So you won't have those higher numbers right. ticking up the average rate. Right, exactly. So some of those months, specifically in Q2, we had monthly report prints of 1% inflation. Yeah. which is just massive for one month on an annual rate, that's that's 12%. Yeah, right. But as those things, we get some alleviation in commodity prices and in, in supply chains, then those monthly prints 
might be you know 0.4 percent, which on an annual basis is five. So as those back end months roll off, and we're replacing them with months with lower inflation than just by default, because it's you know think of it somewhat as an accounting identity, then it has to come down. But the question is, how quickly is it going to come down, and is it going to come down to a level that the Fed's comfortable with, or is it going to be stickier in this say three to five percent range, which it would in turn likely lead them to keep pumping on the brakes of the economy until they can try to bring it down further. And that's really the open question right now. Well, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to, because I know we get time. <clears throat> but I guess I worry about recession. Mm. And, of course, we can say two quarters of negative growth is recession, but then you have the, uh, the people in the White House saying, no, it's not. You know, jobs are really strong. Economy is really a lot better than that. But then you hear people like Jamie Dimon or some of these people who seem to be pretty smart out there saying, we're looking at recession into this year, first part of next year. Mm -hmm. um, because <clears throat> this inflation obviously weighs in on our ability or, or going into a recession, wouldn't you agree? The, as far as? Well, when inflation's high, I think a recession is more likely. Right, because, you know, the old saying is, you know, no <clears throat> economy has gone into recession by itself. Basically, the Fed has... Push, kill, push kill, killed the cycle and pushed us there in an attempt to rein down inflation. So to your point, Commissioner, if, again, inflation doesn't come down as rapidly as we expect and as many expect. And they take more aggressive action. Aggressive than that, mm -hmm. just in a vacuum, would exacerbate sort of the economic weakness that, that we've been seeing more recently. But importantly, you know, some of the numbers that we saw in the first half of the year, um, you know, there was a huge slowdown in private inventory investment. What happened is sort of what's called this bullwhip effect. So coming out of the pandemic, you know, or in the pandemic, you know, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do much shopping. We couldn't do, you know, we couldn't go out and buy stuff. So retailers cut their inventories. And then immediately out of the pandemic, consumption exploded because people could get back out because of the stimulus checks and they had a lot more money. So all, all of a sudden retailers are thinking, oh, we're so far behind the curve here. We need to ramp up our inventories. But now as the stimulus has faded off, they're left with all this inventory that they're not able to sell. So they haven't been reinvesting or building back their inventory stock up because they have all this excess inventory. So that alone has driven a lot of the weakness that we saw in the first half. Once that overhang is sort of worked off over the next couple quarters, then that should turn in from uh, a huge headwind in the first half of the year to at least maybe a, a neutral impact for the economy moving forward. So that's you know sort of one positive signal, at least from an economic perspective, that we might see shift gears from you know driving weakness in the first half to maybe a more benign um, outlook, at least for that segment of the economy through the rest of this year, maybe early 23. So there's always Always these competing factors when you get to that high level number. Some places are doing okay, some not okay, but this inventory dynamic has really driven a lot of the economic weakness and what's that's worked through, then again that huge headwind that we've seen so far this year should hopefully work itself out. Good. So with all that said, why don't we jump ahead to page 13 here and we'll just start talking about uh, market returns. So we'll focus on the chart to the right here. Uh, the first three rows, you see the equity markets from a regional perspective, U.S., international, and emerging. And those green bars are the Q2 numbers. And there were double-digit clients across the board, whether it be U.S., international, developed, or emerging markets, with the U.S. actually being the uh, worst performer amongst the group there. Now, interestingly, below emerging market equities, you see U.S. bonds, much like we saw in the first quarter. Bonds were down alongside equities, which is a little atypical. Uh, usually bonds are that downside protector that provide a little bit of a safe haven when equities are doing poorly. However, with the Fed continuing to raise rates, that put upward pressure on interest rates for intermediate and long-term bonds as well. And when rates go up, bond prices come down. There's an inverse relationship between the two. The other couple things I'd like to mention further down the chart there, those bottom two rows, just as it relates to some of the asset allocation changes that were made during the quarter, you could see global listed infrastructure, which was a new asset class as of uh, May 1st there. 
in an attempt, if you recall, to really diversify sort of the inflation protection assets. We had all REITs, but then we recommended sort of a combination of REITs, infrastructure, and Treasury inflation protected securities. You can see global listed infrastructure, even though it was down around seven and a half percent, that was much better than the broader global equity market, which was down around 15 and a half, and a little bit better than REITs that were down 14.7, which did outperform broad US equity. So in other words, the additional diversification within that inflation bucket, at least for the quarter, was somewhat helpful on a relative basis, even though REITs um, <clears throat> you know, were only a couple of percentage points ahead of the broad U.S. market. So with that said, I just want to make one more comment on page 15 here. Uh, 14 is not all that relevant. It mostly talks about sector returns, which is not relevant for the low SAP since we use broad passive indices. But if you look at the top chart on page 15, just for some context about you know where, where we've been based on the historical record. So this, these are some data just showing the post-World War II S&P 500 bear market. So in other words, when the S&P 500 had a peak to trough <coughs> drawdown of at least 20%. And you can see all the dates, the beginning and ending, the drawdown numbers, and then importantly, whether or not that occurred amid a recession. And I'll circle back to that in just a second. But if you look at the average drawdowns in that second row from up from the bottom, of that table, it's around 32%. But there is a wide range about whether those drawdowns occurred amid a recession or not. If it occurs not alongside a recession, the average drawdown is much lower at 25%. But amid a recession, the average is 36%. And we reference those numbers in that third bullet point over to the left. So again, the key question here is, how the economic environment is going to unfold, because if we do manage to skirt a recession, we're in line with that average of 25%. That's the exact number that we saw the S&P 500 drawdown hit in mid-June. So moving forward here, we think at a minimum that the volatility is likely to continue. Volatility meaning that we saw a pretty you know, weak first half, we've seen a very strong Q3. So not just volatility or weakness to the downside, but a more volatile equity environment than history would suggest, just because we need some clarity around what the economy is going to do, namely how fast inflation comes down and specifically how that impacts Federal Reserve policy. So there's a lot of open questions right now, but the drawdown that we've seen so far is at least in line with what history would suggest. But again, given some of the uncertainty around those issues I just spoke about, as we close out 2022 here, I think, or we think the markets are going to continue to be you know, fairly volatile as we close out the year until we get that clarity. So with that said, let me pause there for any additional questions or comments before we get into the results for the trust itself. Okay. So if you want to jump behind exhibit three here, and we'll start on page 22, just some high level information around the trust on mainly a qualitative basis, and then we'll get a little bit more granular with the data, and then I'm going to make some comments really setting up uh, some of the discussion I would like to have when we meet again in October. So if you look at the top of page 22, you can see the market value of the trust at the end of June was a little north of $8 million. There was a net investment change of down $1 million given the poor equity market and fixed income returns during the quarter. And that resulted in a return for the second quarter for the trust of down 11.1%, which was slightly ahead of that policy index benchmark of down 11.3. So when we look at a difference between how the trust did versus that benchmark, we try to explain it, and that's called attribution. Now, there won't be much to explain because we're mostly passively invested. So what the managers do will be pretty much in lockstep with the indices. So really, it'll just come down to asset allocation. But in this case, and we talked a little bit about this when we met in June, on the positive side or what helped the trust outperform slightly was the transition that was made in the beginning of May. Once the new IPS was put into place, the new asset allocation, and then secondly, related to that, if you recall, looking at the investment vehicles, which were all ETFs that are traded daily to mutual funds, which price once a day, and moving custodians from Schwab, where it's easier to implement any rebalancing with ETFs to a more institutional platform, 
like principal where it's easier to do mutual funds instead, we sort of migrated in that direction. Now we're not all of the way there. We still have some ETFs within the fund. So I'm gonna make a couple comments again as we wrap up here today, just to kind of set the stage for the discussion in October. So that was really under the looking ahead there, and then we'll, um, that's the second bullet point, but then we'll have the recommendations for today in just a couple of minutes here. But if you want to shift gears to page 23, we'll start out with some high level data and then get a little bit more granular. But focusing on that second quarter in the top chart, the summary of cash flows, you can see we began the quarter at $9.16 million. There was a slight net cash flow that was just for some nominal trading fees via Schwab. But that on top of the net investment change left the trust lower by about a little north of $1 million for the quarter. Now we'll tackle the returns in the middle of the page shortly here when we look at them from a pure perspective. But the last thing I wanna note, we look at the bottom table, the asset allocation versus the targets. Given we made the transition on 5-1 and then we had continued equity market weakness in May and June, if you look at the first three rows, which are US, non-US, and emerging market equities, their current allocations versus the policy, we ended about one percentage point underweight equities as we closed out the quarter again, since we had that equity market weakness in the wake of the transition in early May. Now that one percentage point overweight obviously has to be offset somewhere, and that's via fixed income. The second row up from the darker blue row at the bottom, you could see an allocation of 36% relative to the target of 35. So not terribly far off the targets and we've gotten more in line with the targets of markets have rebounded here in Q3 but again we'll give you a more up-to-date look at where things stand when we get to the recommendations in just a second uh, before doing that though if you could jump to page 26 we'll dig into the returns a little bit more deeply here first at a high level compared to uh, similar peers if you note at the top of that chart up top, the title there, you can see uh, investment metrics. Again, that's the third party platform we use to generate the reports. But this specific universe or comparison is for public defined benefit funds less than $50 million. So we made that change per the board's uh, request changing it from the broad public universe to less than $50 million. So it's more of an apples to apples comparison. So there's a ton going on on this page. The key takeaways are really the bottom two rows at the bottom of the table where you see the circle and the triangle all the way to the left. As you work your way from left to right there, those first set of numbers, negative 11, one, and then below that negative 11, three, those are the numbers I cited a second ago for the trust itself and that policy index benchmark. And then to the right there, you see the rankings. So next to 11.1 or negative 11.1, you see 51. That means essentially in line with the median return, the median fund within this universe. It's a similar story year to date. For the one year number, it's a little behind, which is a little bit again of this historical anomaly with the fact that previously to the asset allocation changes in May, the trust had a lot in fixed income relative to this peer group. And as I showed earlier, it's been a very poor environment for fixed income, not just this year, but over the past year. So the asset allocation, strategic asset allocation by the trust itself being more conservative was actually a little bit of a detractor relative to the rest of this peer group. Now, a couple other quick things I wanna mention. Uh, when you look at the three year, obviously there's some overlap there, um, you know, with us and the previous advisor and then the since inception returns, not necessarily commenting on the differences between the return of the trust and that policy index benchmark itself, but just expressing the point that if you look at the rankings next to the policy index returns there, it's just illustrating how important asset allocation is, right? You know, why we spent a lot of time discussing different asset classes, different options last year and the early part of this year. That's gonna be the biggest driver of success over the long term, the biggest driver of the probability of getting to where you need to be. So again, we talked about the importance of that in the past. I wanted to reiterate it here today just to let you know that we did a lot of work around it over the past year, mostly in, in 2021, but it's something we like to revisit at least on you know a one to two year basis. So I think that'll be a project that we revisit uh, at some point next year, but if market conditions dictate, we can certainly take a look at that uh, sooner rather than later.
So with that said, if you want to skip ahead to page 28, please, I want to make some comments around the returns across the individual asset classes, and then a couple of other comments before looking at the recommendations, sort of setting the stage for October here. So in 29, anytime you see that darker brown row, you'll see at the top there, low SAP total fund composite. Composite is just synonymous for asset class, and those returns up top, they're the same ones on the previous page, the same time periods. But each of those other darker rows, again, it says composite, but really means asset class. So you can see the U.S. equity composite, if you will, was down 17% during the quarter, a little bit behind the benchmark. But if you recall from our discussions in May, when we did the transition from a lot of e ETFs to index funds, there was some market impact amid that transition that was a little bit of a detractor for U.S. equities, but on the flip side of that, if you look at the next darker line, actually was very helpful in the non-U.S. equity space, being a, you know almost two percentage points ahead of the benchmark there, similar to the emerging markets, that fourth darker row ahead of the benchmark there. So that transition occurred over pretty much a week. For U.S. equities, it was a little bit of a detractor tractor given market movements amid the transition, but for the other equity asset classes, the developed non-U.S. and emerging markets, it more than offset the negative impact on the U.S. equity side. As far as some of the other asset classes on the page, you see a lot of dashed rows, right? Because those are the newer managers. There's no history yet. So once you know they have more history, you'll see over time, as far as a three-month, year-to-day, so on and so forth, those numbers were populated as those investments uh, have a lengthier time period within the trust itself. So on page 30, just quickly before we spend some time talking about the um, investments themselves and setting the stage for October. Again, up top, you see tips there. No returns outside of all the way to the right, the since inception. Again, that will continue to populate as time progresses. And then U.S. fixed income itself, you can see more or less in line with the policy there, negative 5.5 versus negative 5.4. Again, something we would expect to mimic pretty closely given we're taking a pure passive investment point of view. And again, I still think from a high level, given the size of the fund, being around $8 million, keeping it simple from an investment perspective, low cost, passive, save dollars there, because then as you all know, every dollar that we can save from a fee perspective is a dollar that can continue to compound over time and help get us to where we need to be. And related to that, having a, a smaller fund, you don't necessarily have access to, you know, say different asset classes or cheaper asset classes, or in some places where we would argue, say, the, the best of breed type managers. Now that could change as the fund grows, maybe to 15, 20 million dollars or so. But for right now, given the size, we think this is the most prudent uh, roadmap headed forward right now. Let's keep those costs low and see if we can actually get them lower, which I think we can. If you want to look to page 34, just to give you again a quick synopsis of where I think we could head here with the impact. So this is the fee page uh, where you see all the investments in that top table listed to the left, their respective fee schedules. So again, there's not too many ETFs there as we met. I think it's 32, Pat, sorry. Oh, I apologize, thank, thank you, Ms. Pratt's in 32. <laughs> there is no 34. <laughs> there is no 34. Uh, <laughs> Blank stare from the- uh, Oh, page 32, <laughs> right, please. sorry, Michelle. Um, so if you look at those investments, again, we made that transition to <clears throat> from all ETFs, more to mutual funds to help us with the operational uh, complexity versus the rebalancing. But if you recall, being on the Schwab platform, form that limits the sort of fund families that you have access to. So if you want to make a passive investment in any fund, you have to use a Schwab fund. Okay, but now that the assets have moved to principal, it's what's called open architecture. So for many of these funds, if you look at the first two, the Schwab Total Stock, the Schwab International Index, Fidelity has index funds that do the same thing, but half the cost. And it's the same story for the second fund up from that bottom blue row at the bottom, that U.S. Aggregate Bond Index Fund, four basis points at Schwab. Fidelity has one at about half the cost. So there are additional um, changes we could make, not necessarily changing 
the underlying investments, right? The Fidelity funds are tracking the same thing as the Schwab funds, but they're doing it more cheaply. So in October, I would like to do a similar exercise that we did in April once we did that transition. Again, side-by-side -side comparison, this index fund versus that index fund, and a cost perspective, because if we do ultimately move to these lower cost funds, when you look at that bottom row, the second column from the right, the estimated annual fees about $5,300, you know, just based on quick calculations, that could go down to around 4,200. So, you know, more than $1,000 savings in fees. And then from a percentage perspective to the right, we're at 0.6%, still very, very low cost. We, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. White. No, 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 I, I just had a question. We had the SORP meeting yesterday, and we had the 457B governance uh, committee meeting yesterday. I don't know if you were around for that one. I was and, on the town with Mr. Okay. <laughs> and and my, my question is, since we're speaking about this and saving money and going to different, is we were informed that VOIA, some of the funds that they offer us we were in a higher, you know, like there could be class A that offers it at, you know, say Fidelity 500 index fund. There's a class A that offers it at 65 basis points. And then there's a class B that offers it at 54 basis points. But we were in a higher one. So this um, financial advisor that we hired, you know, at took a look and said, oh, well, I, I can save you by just moving you to these different classes. Hmm. I guess Voya in the 457 has no fiduciary duty to us, so they don't care that they had us in the higher ones, but I assume you <laughs> don't have us in the higher ones, that we have the lowest, we have the best class that we can have for each of these, right? So your comments were around the 457, but your yes, question yes. about the low set, correct? Right. Okay. Right. Yes, exactly. So what really you know we're not in the lowest class right now because the assets were custodied at Schwab and right. how Schwab kind of you know makes money if you will they don't necessarily charge much for custody fees but how they make it a you know say profitable for their firm is you can't buy a Vanguard fund you right. can't buy a fidelity fund you have to use Schwab but now once we're or not once now that the low sap is has been transitioned fully from Schwab to principal we don't have to use the right. Schwab it's open architecture we can use fidelity we can use for Vanguard so prior we weren't in the lowest class because we just but that's enough. what we're seeking now. That's right. what we're seeking now. And those assets gotcha. have been transitioned um, fully, I think, late last week. So again, when we meet in October, we'll bring the analysis of say, you know, this is what we have, this is what it costs, this is a fund that does the same thing right. more cheaply, and, you know, bring that to the board's uh, right. you know, recognition and, and consideration to try or lower those fees as appropriate. I mean, again, they're pretty low, but we can get them down even sure. further. And if, you know, if we're investing in pretty much assets that are doing the same thing from a fiduciary perspective, that's exactly what we should do. Certainly. So why we hired you. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. So that's really setting the stage for uh, some of the discussion in, in October that we'll do. But that wraps up my comments as it relates to the performance report. I'll pause before the recommendations to see if there are additional comments or questions from the board. <clears throat> what we heard yesterday, so I don't have any. But bef before we move on to the recommendations, just for housekeeping, I would look for a motion to approve the uh, second quarter investment performance report. Um, I'll make a motion to um, accept the second quarter investment report from Marquette. I'll second it. I have a first and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Eyes have it, motion carries. Okay. On to the recommendation. On to the recommendation. So you'll find in the back of your performance report inside this back cover, just an insert page, uh, all the way in the back, right inside that hard cover, the page will slide right out. Um, so there's two sides of that page. The first page uh, shows all the investments. Uh, it's titled Fund Allocation. So before getting into the specific recommendations, you can see in that third column over, the total assets have increased by about $460,000 during the current quarter just given 
given, uh, again, as I mentioned, equity markets have rebounded pretty dramatically. So two columns over from that, you can see the rebalancings showing $750,000. So that transfer has been made, and I did get confirmation from principal that they received that first installment, uh, first of four for the current fiscal year. So that's ready to be invested. So for the 750 there, you know, again, trying to keep things simple, trying to keep costs down, but we're simply proposing is largely a proportional increase across the board up and down that page with those specific investments. And if you look at the bottom right table that shows the asset allocation subsequent to that rebalancing, you can see the differences. Anything in red is obviously you know below target and vice versa for green. So this would leave us still about a half a percentage point underweight equities, which I think is uh, a little bit prudent just given my comments that I made earlier. And um, <clears throat> given the you know, massive rebound we've seen in the first seven, eight weeks in August, and that overweight expressed mainly, or excuse me, that underweight expressed mainly through an overweight to cash all the way at the bottom. You know, we need to keep some residual cash for either opportunities or the payment of fees and expenses and things of that nature. So this would be the specific recommendation under that rebalancing column. Again, the bottom right table will show you where we'd end up from an asset allocation perspective. And then on page two, it's ex um, defined explicitly. Uh, we recommend the committee approve the proposed rebalancing as defined on the previous page and about eight additions across the board to get that asset allocation back in line. And then on the right there, everything coming from cash for that $750,000 that has just moved into principal earlier this week. Um, so with that said, again, please let me pause for, for comments or questions from the board. So we're just moving cash into these. We're just invested into these. Yes, sir. And what we're doing is we're doing it essentially across the board. And this was the sort of the dollar cost average Average approach that the board, so the the full fiscal year, $3 million. So obviously this is a quarter of that. So we'll revisit this again in December, Q1 next year, or Q3 from the fiscal year, and then again in Q4. Um, in the middle and or right before the middle of next year. So this is an exercise that we'll be doing pretty regularly as those contributions are made. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the committee, approve the recommendation for market strategies to invest the cash that's recently been um, added to the account into the shares or the, the categories they recommend. Is that clear enough? Certainly. I'll second. Okay, I have a first and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. Next up is the plan administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Weisskopf. So my report represents any transactions from the trust since our last meeting in June. Um, the first item is the payment of investment consulting, $2,070.65. I'm confirming the custodial transfer from Schwab to principal. We, uh, principal received the funds from Schwab on August 9th and 10th, and they completed the transfer at $8.6 million. In the 2023 budget session, the commissioners approved a contribution of $3 million to this LOSAP trust. And as discussed at the last meeting, the first contribution of 25% or 750,000 was sent to the trust on Monday, August 22nd. Uh, that's the transactions that happened since our last meeting. And the last item I have is to note when we're meeting again on October 28th and December 2nd for the LOSAP trust. I move to a uh, approve the plan administrator's report. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it, motion carries. 
I believe that is it for the meeting. I would <laughs> entertain another motion. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. I have a first and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it, motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.